loves a gamble on Seventh Heaven. My money's on Rod. You're placing bets? Mine's on Jimmy. Seventh Heaven. Monday night at 7 on WGN. Brickhouse, the man with a voice for all seasons, silenced at the age of 82. But his voice lives on in our memories. Tonight, we remember Jack. Welcome to this WGN News special. I'm Steve Sanders. And I'm Allison Payne. 48 hours after his death from heart failure, there's an outpouring of emotion across Chicago and the nation. Tonight, family, friends, and former co-workers remember Jack and prepare to say goodbye. WGN's Muriel Claire begins our special coverage live from the place that became Jack's second home. Wrigley Field. Good evening, Muriel. Good evening, Steve. You know, you never know when you're making a memory. And Jack Brickhouse was the stuff of memories and the finest storyteller this side of heaven. And in the 48 hours since he departed this life, friends and strangers alike have stepped up with their own stories. When Jack Brickhouse succumbed to heart failure before dawn Thursday morning, he caught everybody off guard. After collapsing while getting ready for Harry Carey's funeral February 27th, Brickhouse was hospitalized for removal of a cancerous brain tumor. He came through the surgery and left the hospital at the end of April, cancer-free and with the prognosis for a full recovery. A longtime friend recalls the last time he saw Jack at Harry Carey Lookalike Day just last Friday in Chicago. I sat right next to Jack. And we visited, you know, and, and he looked, uh, a, a, he a, actually looked weak, but I mean, what he's been through, but he was very alert. And ac they asked, asked him to say a few words, which he did, and made some good comments and a couple of funny things about Harry. He was 82, a legend, yeah, a national yeah. treasure, a gentle giant, a wonderful human being. Friends and strangers alike have been eager to share their memories with us. At Chicago's Broadcast Museum, where a picture of the legendary broadcaster is draped in black, passers-by stopped to sign a book of condolences. So he was uh, very meaningful to me, and I happened to just be traveling here uh, just this week. And um, yesterday I listened to the news, and I heard that he had passed away, and it was, again, very sad, but I was also glad that I was here somehow to be able to participate in, uh, in his... Uh, in, in just basically honoring him. Uh, Jack and remember Ernie Banks' 500th home run and him saying, hey, hey, I mean, that was like seven years old and I remember it. I, so and we'll, we'll all miss him. So many wonderful stories have come out about Brickhouse, not the least of them from Sun-Times columnist Irv Kupsonet, the man who was paired with Brickhouse for 24 seasons of broadcasting the Chicago Bears games, and Kay Joyce, his secretary for 20 years. But he was just so interesting when he would call me in for dictation. We would talk for an hour, telling me about boxing and football. And he said, well, we better do some work. Let me tell you another story. And he often told the story of the broadcasting in New York that there was a famous actress before your time named Tallulah Bankhead. And she was quite a baseball fan. And they put her in the booth with Jack. And Jack had one complaint. Her voice was deeper than his, and he had a lot of trouble identifying himself. But in truth, an identity crisis is something Jack Brickhouse never knew. I walked down the street in Chicago with him a lot, and you know, everybody knew Jack Brickhouse. Everybody knew Jack Brickhouse, and he'd always have a good word for everybody. Finally, imagine growing up listening to your favorite sportscaster, and then when you're all grown up, that sportscaster you've admired for so long becomes your stepfather. To have an opportunity to get to know him the way that I did, um, he was such a wonderful, kind person. Um, and just to be able to develop that kind of personal relationship is something that will always be a tremendous memory that I will have with me for the rest of my life. A brick house is survived by his second wife, Pat, a daughter, Jean, a grandson, Noah, three stepchildren, and five step-grandchildren. And I think the sign over my shoulder that says, We'll miss you, Jack, says it all. Reporting live from in front of Wrigley Field, back to you. Sure does. Thank you, Muriel. 
Funeral arrangements for Jack have now been announced. Visitation will be held on Monday and Tuesday at the Blake Lamb Funeral Home on North Dearborn from 3 until 9 o'clock. The funeral service will be held on Wednesday at 11 o'clock at St. James Cathedral in East Huron. WGN-TV will carry the service live. And in lieu of flowers, the family requests donations be made to the Jack Brickhouse Memorial Fund, care of Midwest Bank and Trust, 300 South Michigan, Chicago, 60604. Funds will be distributed to Jack Brickhouse's favorite charities. This is a somber week for the Cubs. For the second time in six months, the organization has lost a legendary broadcaster. Sunday was Harry Carey Day at Wrigley Field. Fans in oversized glasses pay tribute to the man who replaced Jack Brickhouse. A life-size statue of Harry will be unveiled outside Wrigley Field at the beginning of the 1999 season. Cubs management says Brick also will be honored for his enormous contribution to broadcasting. I think we're going to address that shortly after the, uh, the funeral. I think Jack played a huge role in all of the wonderful things that have gone on at Wrigley Field. He was really part of the foundation, I think, of the success we enjoy at the gate, and uh, we're certainly not going to neglect him. Jack Brickhouse was a trailblazer, paving the way for a whole generation of young sportscasters. Among them, our own Rich King. Rich joining us now for our special coverage. Okay, Allison. Steve, Allison, uh, Steve, the, uh, growing up in Chicago, watching Jack Brickhouse, and then one day finding yourself writing a sports copy are the things dreams are made of. Jack was a giant, a pioneer. His style was adopted by every kid growing up in Chicago in the 1950s and the 1960s. And of all the players Jack Brickhouse covered over the years, the one player who almost fused with Jack at the zenith of his popularity was Mr. Cub, Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks. This is perhaps Jack's most famous call. Ernie Banks bidding for his 500th career home run at Wrigley Field. It seems like only yesterday. Jarvis fires away. That's the fly ball. Beat the left. Back. Back. That's it. That's it. Hey, he did it. Ernie Banks got number 500. It was almost like Jack did it himself. Because I remember rounding the bases and... And then after the game was over, he came down on the field as always. And he was just so happy. We had tears in our eyes just with the joy of it. And each day as I went along, Jack used to tell me, now, when are you going to hit the 500? I mean, I know it's going to come, you know. And finally it happened on May 12, 1970, and he shared it with me. Ernie Banks loved Jack Brickhouse. That's a love that will last even though Jack is no longer with us. I was so saddened when I found out we had lost Jack. I was with him last week at Wrigley Field, and we were sitting there talking about good memories and good times there and uh, he's gone now but I learned a lot from him he was just a wonderful man he was friendly with everybody he taught me a lot of things about uh, life and how to play the game I worked with him in 69 he was with me in 77 in the Hall of Fame he was with me all the time the happy things that happened in my life in baseball Ernie Banks of course part of the uh, Cubs golden era back in the Late 60s, early 70s, those teams were in the chase every year in the National League, and Banks had a lot to do with it, lots of help also, in keeping Jack Brickhouse in great form from guys like power hitters such as Billy Williams and Ron Sano. Do you recall when Billy helped save Ken Holtzman's no-hitter at Wrigley Field? That's well hit. And there, I believe, goes the no-hitter. Caught! Caught by Williams! comes to life when Jack Brickhouse makes those calls. Every Cub fan knows Ron Sano, a radio analyst now for WGN, the Chicago Cubs, and Billy Williams is a coach for the Chicago Cubs. Both are live at Bush Stadium now where the Cubs take on the Cardinals tonight at 7 o'clock here on WGN. One, of course, a Hall of Famer, one a should-be Hall of Famer, and Billy Williams, I tell you, memories of Jack Brickhouse, not hard to come by, are they? As, as you can see, it's pretty noisy down here because the Cubs playing the Cardinals. And it seemed like every time we come over, it's the same way. But uh, we got some sad news yesterday morning. I remember when Shirley woke up, she watched uh, a little news on television, and she came on and said uh, Jack had passed away. And not only the Chicago Cubs, but the Chicago Bears and, of course, the Chicago White Sox, wrestling, everybody has lost a great uh, sports announcer in Chicago. And it's just a sad feeling over Chicago area because we lost one of our great ones. As far as uh, <clears throat> my memories uh, with Jack are wonderful memories because he was always upbeat. Uh, he was part of the ball club. I loved uh, 
flying from city to city with him. He had so many stories. He was one of the best one-liners. But the wonderful thing about Jack, on the field, off the field, uh, he was always upbeat. And I remember coming up to Big Leagues at 20 years old. I was not polished at all, and I'm still not too polished. But one thing about him, he made you feel very relaxed behind the mic. He, he really did. Uh, yeah, when I first came up, I was a young man coming up. Ernie had been here, of course, five years. And when we used to have the 10th inning show, every time you went up to be on 10th inning show, you was nervous walking up in the stand. But he found the way they asked the right question, and it made you more relaxed up there. So uh, anytime you talk to him and have a good conversation with him, it was great. And uh, Jack has done a great job for the Chicago area. I remember he used to have the sports show on WG and I remember one day I don't know whether I was swinging the bat well I wasn't swinging the bat well but he introduced me as uh, here's Billy William wearing number 26 for the Cubs sometimes he swing like Ted Williams and sometimes he swing like Esther Williams <laughs> very seldom like Esther Williams <laughs> <laughs> okay thanks a lot guys I appreciate it Okay. <laughs> you can tell those guys were schooled by Jack Preckhouse. Both are great storytellers themselves. Billy and Ron out in St. Louis for that Cub game. I tell you, it's uh, quite an evening for the Cubs and quite an evening uh, out in St. Louis. Jack wanted me to plug the game at 7 o'clock, I know, so it's coming up afterward. But uh, my memories of Jack Preckhouse abound in Chicago this weekend. And some funny ones there. Yeah, Thanks, those sir. guys are great. <laughs> Long before he became a household name in the Windy City, a young Jack Brickhouse was breaking into broadcasting in Peoria. The year was 1934. Jack was just 18 years old. Gene Robinson, the former general manager of WMBD in Peoria, recalls the creative way Jack got a broadcasting job. The WMBD was committed to network programs uh, in the evening, and so there was no way they could consider doing a live broadcast of Bradley basketball. Jack thought that uh, what they should do is record the broadcast and play it back at midnight so people could hear the uh, Bradley game on the radio. Well, the manager of the station said, no, nobody would be interested in that after the game's over, and they all knew the outcome. So Jack said, how about doing a survey? Well, they made the mistake of letting Jack do the survey. And he went downtown in Peoria and uh, took ballots, and the first 10 people he talked to said no, they weren't interested in hearing a delayed broadcast of Bradley. Uh, so that didn't satisfy Jack, so he took the rest of the ballots into the, the pool hall nearby and sat down at a table and started filling them out. And lo and behold, out of 100 ballots, 63 of those folks said yes, they would be interested in uh, hearing Bradley on a delay basis. And from there, Jack became known as the voice for all seasons. That voice eventually would be heard all around the nation. As a Cubs broadcaster, Brickhouse built a huge following. WGN's Jerry Orr joins us from the Sports Collector Show at the Rosemont Convention Center, where fans are remembering Jack. Jerry. Let me tell you, the prices on Jack Brickhouse sports memorabilia are up tonight. He was a pioneer in sports broadcasting, but he was more than just an announcer. He was an entertainer. He was a storyteller. And that's why Jack Brickhouse connected with the fans. And it's going to really count for something. The very essence of sport is not merely competition, but competition with a meaning. And that's what we have starting as of today. I'm Jack Brickhouse along with Vince Lloyd. Very Jack Brickhouse called eight no-hitters in the broadcast booth, including the last the one thrown at Wrigley Field. It was 1972. Milt Pappas lost his perfect game with two outs in the ninth but saved the no-hitter. There's a high fly ball. Short right, should be caught. Fan zone's out there on the grass. He has it. It's a no-hitter for Pappas. A no-hitter for Milt Pappas. Jack recalled a conversation the next day between Pappas and home plate umpire Bruce Freming. Pappas blamed Freming for calling ball four on a very close pitch. It's a ball, and Pappas is in rage. He said, for God's ball sake, ball. Bruce, why didn't you call one of those a strike? They were both strikes. Why didn't you call one of them a strike? And you'd be history. You'd be one of a half a dozen umpires to call a perfect game in the history of the game. And Fremming said, Milt, if I had called either one of those a strike, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. And Papa said, well then, how do you live with yourself with all those other lousy calls you make? <laughs> well, he didn't use the word lousy. During those years, the Cubs were lovable losers thanks to Jack's enthusiasm and his signature call. 
Miller and Wynn. They're both back. 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 Hey, hey! It's a home run for Bags. Get a boy, Ernie. Jack had the hey, hey. Oh, I mean, you know, it, it was it was, it was, was his moniker. Hey, hey. Even when he was playing gin rummy out at uh, Ridgemore Country Club and he he blitzed somebody, it was hey, hey. <laughs> Generations of Cub fans were entertained by Jack and his Brickhouse-isms. Back, 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 hey, hey, Ernie, 500. Back, back, hey, hey, and it's out. Good old Jack. I know he'll be remembered. I hope they give him as much of a tribute as he gave to Harry Carey. I mean, both were great in their own way. He spoke what he felt. True fan at heart. And that's what Chicago is all about, Wrigley Field. I get goosebumps just talking about it. God took him so Harry had somebody to talk to up there. He needed someone to talk to about sports up there and baseball. So Harry and uh, Jack are together right now, and they're looking down laughing, having a good laugh. There were so many other brick houses like Tissue Paper Lead. Any old kind of a run wins it, and next time you come by, bring my stomach. And we rolled around to the 10th inning. Here are the happy totals. Often they were here are the unhappy totals, and often the Cubs were a day late and a dollar short. But Jack Brickhouse, the Hall of Famer, never lost touch with the fans. Live in Rosemont, Jerry Ower, WGN News. Thank you, Jerry. Well, Jack Brickhouse had a lot of special moments in his life. And a lot of them didn't have anything to do with sports. Few people know that, among other things, Brickhouse also covered news. WGN's Eddie Aruza is live in the Cubs broadcast booth with that part of the story tonight. Eddie. Allison and Steve, most people will always remember Jack Brickhouse as the voice that came to them from the friendly confines here yelling, Hey, hey, on those seemingly rare occasions when the Cubs would hit a home run. Now, Brickhouse will always be associated with Chicago sports casting, but he also had the ability to cover all kinds of stories from all around the world, and he did. From his early days as a radio announcer in the 1930s and 40s, Jack Brickhouse set the tone for his career in broadcasting. He began by covering everything from barn dances to band concerts, as well as Bradley University basketball games. And while his professional life was mainly behind the microphone at sporting events, Jack was also a newsman who covered the world. You name it, I've done it, including read the funnies to the kiddies on Sunday morning, MC barn dances, did a man on the street for six years, and fires and parades and disasters and catastrophes and wars and you name it, I've done it. Beginning with FDR, seven presidents gave Brickhouse exclusive interviews. Jack covered the funeral of Winston Churchill, as well as the Vietnam War. He was comfortable talking with popes, politicians, and celebrities, all of whom knew the name Jack Brickhouse. Because of his early work uh, on, the, uh, on the Dumont Television Network as a, as a, as a uh, baseball announcer and as a uh, wrestling announcer, uh, he was the one who had gone into homes well beyond Chicago as a network voice. So people growing up around the United States knew the importance of, of being associated with Jack Brickhouse. At a Bears game in 1940, Brickhouse met actor Ronald Reagan. They remained friends, and 43 years later, at Jack's induction into the Baseball Hall of Fame, President Reagan sent a message of admiration. That personality, that voice, that charisma, Jack, you've got what it takes. Have you ever thought about going into politics? If politics ever did call, Jack never answered, preferring instead to become a broadcaster unlike any before, or perhaps any to come. He covered a lot of ground, and I don't think another broadcaster is ever going to be in a position ever to do that again. Back live here at Wrigley Field, where the outfield scoreboard already reflects what many here in Chicago and across the country are feeling. We will miss you, Jack Brickhouse, sportscaster and newsman. Live from the broadcast booth at Wrigley Field, Eddie Arusa, WGN News. And some tears on the field as well. Thank you, Eddie. You bet. Jack Brickhouse officially retired from WGN 17 years ago, but he kept an office here at our studios. Jack was never far away from the broadcasting powerhouse he helped to build, brick by brick. Deep to right, back, run, back, it is a doorway to a million memories, memories of a half century of television history. He was a frequent visitor to this modest office, and for those of us who came to WGN after his retirement, Jack Brickhouse was our institutional memory, 
a broadcasting keepsake of WGN's legacy. My first day here, uh, 10 years ago, he walked in and he said, Hi, I'm Jack Brickhouse. He introduced himself as if I needed to know who he was. Who he was was our history, the first voice ever heard on WGN television. The year was 1948. It was an experimental broadcast of a Golden Gloves boxing match. His ties to families who own Chicago's great sports teams, the Wrigley's, Comiskey's, and Wirtz, helped him to become a sports executive. It was an off-air talent, another WGN legend, Ward Quall, recognized early on. He said, Jack should do more than just the play-by-play. -play. Perhaps we can work him into management. So Jack became vice president and manager of sports. And long before WGN became a superstation, beaming sports events throughout the hemisphere, it was Brick who helped lay the foundation of the rich tradition of WGN sports until he called his last game in 1981. A lot of the things we accomplished in my almost two decades of administration of what we called then WGN Continental Broadcasting Company couldn't have happened without Jack Brickhouse. He was still an ambassador of WGN to the public. Um, even long after he retired. He, w he was until the day he died. You know, he was Mr. WGN. Tonight, our flag flies at half-staff for Mr. WGN, the man who, as much as anyone, made us who we are today. Jack certainly left his mark here at WGN and in the world of sports. From the highs of the Willie Mays catch of the 54 World Series to the lows of the 69 Chicago Cubs, he was a workhorse with all the style of a thoroughbred. WGN's Bill Weir looks back at Jack's career. How can you possibly describe Jack Brickhouse to those unfortunate youngsters who never heard his work? Maybe they know him like this, weakened by a brain tumor in March, but still in great spirits just one week ago, soaking up the love at a Harry Carey look-alike contest. But tonight, we remember stronger days, and the fact no one in the history of sports broadcasting spent more time in front of a microphone, and few did it as well. Brick was as much a part of the athletic Illuminati as the players he covered, but he was far more than just a sportscaster. Equally comfortable with Bob Hope and the Pope. He covered politicians and presidents. Bleacher rights are going to be treated as some sunshine after all. And as I said, there she goes. There's the heat. It's a good one. And I believe it was nailed by Jungle Jim Rivera of the White Sox. Yes, sir. Good old Jim. Now Rivera is uh, imploring the president to unwrap the ball for him. You name it, I've done it including read the funniest of the kiddies on Sunday morning, MC Barn Dances, did a man on the street for six years, and fires and parades and disasters and catastrophes and wars and you name it, and I've done it. John Beasley Brickhouse began broadcasting in Peoria in 1934. He entered a radio contest with six contestants and finished fifth. But they saw something in the kid and put him on the air for 17 bucks a week. Peoria was Broadway. Peoria Broadcasting for a guy who had been fired from a job filling bottles with gin at Hiram Walker and couldn't find a decent job in tough times to keep going to college and who wasn't that great a student or that great an athlete, to be able to just break into broadcasting was great. His coverage ran the gamut, including an entire show strapped to the WMBD Tower. He got in a bit of trouble for causing a 10-mile traffic jam and after asking if acting legend John Barrymore had any theater experience, a boss suggested that Jack should try sports casting. His newfound skills brought him to Chicago's WGN Radio in 1940. And eight years later, as WGN TV went on the air, Jack's was the first voice heard, calling a Golden Gloves boxing match. He was versatile, everything from wrestling to golf. He and old friend Irv Kupsinik called Bears football for 24 years, and he did Bulls basketball after negotiating the team's first contract on the back of a bar placemat. But it was baseball that will claim Jack more than 5,000 games, nearly that many wonderful moments. It's a no-hitter for Kenny Holtzman! It's a no-hitter for Kenny Holtzman! A no-hitter for the kid, Bert Hooten. It's a no-hitter for Pappas! Jarvis fires away. That's a fly ball deep to left. Hawks back. That's it. That's it. Hey! Uh, about the second year we were televising, Hank Sauer hit one, and I guess I yelled that, and I had been doing it without realizing it. 
and the crew superimposed Hey Hey on the monitor at the booth, and we all cracked up on it and decided after that to leave it in. Hey Hey, holy mackerel, no doubt about it, the Cubs are on their way. Hey Hey! A more historical moment came in 1962 when the new Telstar satellite relayed the first international broadcast across the Atlantic. Among the sampling of American voices beamed from above was that of Jack at Wrigley. Well, we realize that all of this doesn't make much sense to you folks in Europe, but if we hadn't shown you a bit of our national game on this first transatlantic show, we'd never have heard the end of it. As a matter of fact, right now, our colleagues who are doing the translating are going crazy trying to say runs, hits, and errors in Swedish and Italian. In any case, here it is, a brief glimpse of American baseball played in the biggest arena in the world, all the way from Wrigley Field in Chicago to the Coliseum in Rome. As high as his voice traveled there, his heart sunk equally low in 1969. The Cubs' September plummet is one of the epic fold jobs in sports and as close as he would ever come to a World Series at Wrigley. Yet Brick stayed upbeat the entire time. There are times when you're hungover and you don't want to work. You had a fight with your wife. Uh, you had a battle with the front office. Uh, a lot of things can happen. You just plain don't feel good. You're exhausted. You're tired. It's a lousy game. You had a fight with the manager. But I think professionalism takes over. I think there's a line in Bob Hope's theme song that describes not only baseball, but also our business very well, Milo, our broadcasting business. And the line reads, you may have been a headache, but you never were a bore. Thanks for the memories. And with that, Brick signed off in the strike-shortened season of 1981, but kept a high profile with WGN Radio as host of Sports Central. He even joined his Cubs replacement on Channel 9's sports scene, but the pinnacle of Jack's life came in 1983. Wife pat in the stands on a beautiful day in Cooperstown, New York. It's a contradiction, baseball is. It can be the simplest of games, and yet it can be the most involved. It is the game I love. The trains, the planes, the cabs, the buses, they've carried me millions of miles through the years to get where I most wanted to be, the ball game. I would have to say my fondest memory, if I had to name one, was Cooperstown. That's it. That's the ultimate for any baseball announcer and it's uh, something that you know I, I was so proud of it when Jack was inducted into the Hall of Fame veteran WGN sports producer Jack Rosenberg helped write his acceptance speech a memory Rosenberg will never forget here it is I said I have one line in there uh, countless people have brought me to this pinnacle you know who you are. You have my undying gratitude. And Jack started to cry. I'd been like, with Jack, we're like brothers. He stood up at my wedding. I wrote the book on Jack, his life story. Thanks for listening. And this is the only time I ever saw him cry. We close our special Remembering Jack with some final words from that Hall of Fame speech and photographs from Jack's life. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and Jack, thank you. Good night, everybody. It's been my privilege to broadcast the exploits of the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox for 40 years or more. There in Wrigley Field and Comiskey Park, I have experienced the joy and the heartbreak, probably more of the latter than the former. But Chicago and its beautifully loyal fans have had a resiliency which has kindled a perpetual flame of hope. In the fantasy of my dreams, I have imagined myself as the announcer for a Cubs-White Sox World Series, a series that would last seven games, with the final game going extra innings being suspended because of darkness at Wrigley Field. 